Good evening, and welcome to Exit Theater Presents. My name is Christina Algello. Tonight's live stream performance features Lilith Theater's production of Hick, A Love Story, written by Terry Baum and Pat Bond, and performed by Terry Baum as Lorena Hickok, a famous lesbian journalist in the 1920s and 30s, who was also known for everyone as Hick, and very studied still this day for her expertise in journalism, and Paula Barish as Eleanor Roosevelt, Hick's dear one, as they called each other, and the first lady of this country from 1933 to 1945. Hick, A Love Story, is a biographical play that brings to life these two extraordinary women and tells the story of their passionate love affair and lifelong friendship, documented by 2,336 letters that Eleanor wrote to Hick over a period of 30 years. Hick gave these letters to the FDR Presidential Library in Hyde Park with the stipulation that the boxes wouldn't be opened until 10 years after her death, which was in 1968. The letters were first opened and read by Doris Faber, who was horrified and tried to suppress them. But Mrs. Roosevelt's letters were used for this show with the permission of her estate, and the words you hear are Eleanor's own. I first saw Hick at the 2019 San Francisco Fringe Festival, where it won Best of Fringe. The show has gone on to full productions in New York, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C., after being developed through reading versions across the U.S. and Mexico. Tonight's version, directed by Carolyn Myers, with music by Scrumbly Coldwin, has been restaged for Exit Theater Presents. <laughs> Look what came in the mail today. A letter from the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Presidential Library. Hmm. March 18th, 1968. Dear Miss Hickok. I am writing to you because I have heard that you were a good friend of Eleanor Roosevelt. Oh, this is from the director. Oh my goodness. I think I know what this is about. Um, and that you had a, a, that you were a good friend of Eleanor Roosevelt for many years and that you had a lively and extensive correspondence with her. Ooh, extensive, you better believe it. You see this desk crammed with letters and I've got a bedroom closet full of letters from my dear one, maybe more than a thousand. I would love to talk with you about donating the correspondence between you and Mrs. Roosevelt to the archives. Oh, it's the National Archives. Mm. Well, I always knew this letter would arrive one day. Of course he knows Eleanor and I were close. In the beginning, we went everywhere together. Hell, the press used to call me first friend. But he has no idea how close we were. And he hasn't a clue that the letters prove just how close. I keep some of my favorites right here. Oh, how I want to put my arms around you in reality instead of in spirit. Please keep most of your heart in Washington as long as I'm here, for most of mine is with you. A heart full of me would like to fly to you tonight. Devotedly, E.R. This is a letter from Eleanor Roosevelt to me, Lorena Hickok. A heart full of me. Makes no sense, does it? That's why it's so wonderful. <laughs> we were so in love. I've got boxes and boxes of letters from my dear one, starting in 1933 and going all the way until she died in 1962. That was six years ago, and 
now the director of the FDR library wants me to give all the letters to the National Archive. My dearest one, I looked at all the new models in the furniture factory. She was actually a partner in a furniture factory. The number of projects that woman took up. One corner cupboard I long to have for our camp or cottage or house. Which is it to be? I've always thought of it as in the country, but I don't think we ever decided on the variety of abode nor the furniture. We probably won't argue. Oh, probably won't argue, huh? <laughs> we had a plan. We loved our plan. When FDR was finished being president, we would run away to a little cottage in the woods and read poetry to each other. <laughs> well, no one could have imagined that he would run for president four times and win. We never got that corner cupboard or any other furniture. This is my inheritance from my dear one. The letters, hundreds, thousands. To donate or not to donate to the archive, that is the question. Well, I always thought I'd end up an old woman with a desk and a closet full of newspaper clippings. Well, not letters. I was a reporter and a damned good one. The highest paid gal reporter in the land. That's right. Until Eleanor Roosevelt came along and turned my life upside down. That was in 1932, the very first time FDR ran for president. The Associated Press assigned me to cover Eleanor. The first time that any reporter had been assigned to cover the wife of a candidate. Well, I was spending all my time with her. That was my job. Of course I fell in love with her. Who wouldn't? That magnificent woman, those hypnotic blue eyes. But I had no idea, never imagined that she felt anything for me until that afternoon in the train compartment. Now, the campaign was doing a whistle stop tour across the whole country and we were having tea and Eleanor turned to me and said, Hick, I want to get to know you better. And she gave me a look. I'll tell you, that look started it all. It all started at that moment. So she started, not me. I never would have had the nerve. From then on, we spent a lot of time together. One night we stayed up really late talking and she told me about her childhood. Well, you think somebody like that, born with a silver spoon in her mouth, just glided through life. But her mother died when she was young, just like mine. And her father drank. Now, she didn't get thrown out of the house at the age of 14 like I did, but still, we had so much in common. I felt like she could see my soul. Oh, I was a goner, and I just kept on going. Every once in a while, I would stop, and I would say to myself, not only is this woman married, her husband could very well be the next president of the United States. What the hell are you doing? But I didn't give a damn if I lost my job, went to jail or, or burned in hell. Nothing mattered except the chance to look into her eyes one more day, the feeling that she, she saw me cared about me. We were back in New York City before I got up the nerve to stay to her. Eleanor Roosevelt, 
I'm in love with you. I want to take you home and make love to you. Well, something like that. And she said to me, why, Hick, I thought you'd never ask. Something like that. I don't remember the exact words. As soon as we got in my apartment, I got out the only valuable thing I owned, a beautiful ring, a diamond and sapphire band. I slipped it on her finger. I asked her to be mine. She started crying. Then I started crying. Then I took her to my bed. That was October, one month before the election. From then on, we spent every moment together alone, if we could manage. It wasn't easy being in the public eye. We got good at secret looks. Oh, the thrill of her hand brushing my shoulder. <laughs> That went on for five months. Hmm. Then it was March 4th, 1933, Inauguration Day. FDR became president. Eleanor became first lady. They moved into the White House. My job covering her for the AP was over, so I wasn't spending time with her for work. And everything just fell apart. Well, she was too busy for little Hickey. The last straw was our date to have tea at the White House before I left town. I show up at the gate. They can't let me in. She forgot to put my name on the list. Well, I find when I finally get in after a damn long wait, she has no time for me. And she knew I was leaving. She's come to her senses. That's what I thought. How could she have ever loved me, a pervert? It was always ridiculous. I was devastated. But that's when she wrote the first letter to me. It's in the desk. I can find it. The White House, March 8th, 1933. Hick, my dearest, I cannot go to bed tonight without a word to you. I felt as though a part of me was leaving when you left. You have grown to be so much a part of my life that it is empty without you, even though I am busy every moment. Oh, oh, darling, I felt I'd brought you so much discomfort and hardship today and almost more heartache than you could bear, and I don't want to make you unhappy. All my love... And I shall be saying to you over thought waves in the next few minutes, good night, my dear one. Angels guard thee, God protect thee. My love enfold thee all the night through. <sighs> Always yours, E.R. <laughs> Hold the presses. It's March 8th, 1933. We've got a brand new president, and he's going to pull this country out of that damn depression. He'll put everyone to work. He'll regulate the banks. And his wife is in love with me. I am the luckiest gal in the world. Another letter, the very next day, March 9th. My pictures are nearly all up, and I have you in my sitting room where I can look at you most of my waking hours. 
I can't kiss you in person, so I kiss your picture. Good night and good morning. Oh. Don't laugh. And I kiss your letter. Mm. Oh, oh, March 10th. One more day marked off. My dear, when we meet, may I forget there are other other reporters present? Or must I behave? I shall want to hug you to death. This woman is incorrigible. You must behave. I can hardly wait. A world of love to you. Good night and God bless you, light of my life. March 12th. She couldn't make my birthday. Hit, darling. All day I've thought of you and another birthday when I will be with you. And yet tonight you sounded so far away and formal. Oh, I want to put my arms around you. I ache to hold you close. Your ring is a great comfort. I look at it and think she does love me or I wouldn't be wearing it. She wore my ring to the inauguration all day. The ceremony, the dinner, the, the ball, all of it. Remember one thing always, no one is just what you are to me. I'd rather be writing to you than anything else at this moment. I've never enjoyed being with anyone the way I enjoy being with you. Eleanor is writing me every day and she calls me too. One night we talked for hours on the phone and right after she hung up, she wrote me this letter. Hick, darling, oh, how good it was to hear your voice on the phone tonight. Words are so inadequate to describe what it meant to me. My son Jimmy was nearby and I couldn't say je t'aime et je t'adore as I long to do. But always remember I am saying it. I go to sleep at night thinking of you and repeating our little saying, je t'aime et je t'adore. No one is like you, Hick. I love you and good night. E.R. I knew that je t'aime meant I love you in French, but je t'adore sounded like shut the door to me. So the very first time Eleanor said, Hick, je t'aime et je t'adore, I thought she was saying, I love you and shut the door. Well, her wish was my command. I shut the damn door. <laughs> She can always cheer me up when I'm down by whispering tenderly in my ear, Hick, darling, shut the door. <laughs> yeah. My life is like a beautiful dream. Well, except for one fly in the ointment. A monstrous fly, my boss. He's been hounding me for months for inside dope on the Roosevelt. Roosevelt's I can't give him any. That would betray Eleanor's trust. A reporter should never get too close to her sources. Never. I'm not just close to the center of power. I'm I'm sleeping with Power's wife. I have to choose between Eleanor and the AP. I choose love. Oh, it breaks my heart. But I have to quit the AP. Well, I'm not the only one out of a job. Everybody is. We're in the middle of a great big depression. The government is creating thousands of jobs and I got one of them. 
I'm chief investigator for the Federal Relief Administration. It's part of FDR's New Deal. I'm traveling all over the country. Uh, I hate being so far from my dear one, but uh, I, I need the money. I'm talking with teachers, preachers, farmers, bankers, the unemployed, anyone, everyone. Then I write a report to my new boss, Harry Hopkins, and I send it to him and a copy to Eleanor. Mr. Hopkins said to me, Hick, don't pull your punches. I need to know where the New Deal is working and where it's not. I worry I'm not up to the task. How funny you are about your reports. Of course they're good, absorbingly interesting. FDR told me he wished your letters could be published. He's hard to please and always asks if I've anything to read from you. That's what keeps me going, letters from my dear one. What a book you'll be able to write on how we live. I can see what you have seen and feel as you felt just reading your letters. How small one's worries seem in comparison to what so many human beings have been through. I'm tired, but very well. I would give a good deal to put my arms around you and to feel yours around me. I love you deeply and tenderly, devotedly. ER. And a heart full of me wants to fly to you tonight. Mm -hmm. <sighs> November 1st, 1933. Minot, North Dakota. Dear Mr. Hopkins, into the relief office came today a little middle-aged farmer, skin like leather, heavily, not heavily calloused, grimy hands, incongruously attired in a worn white flannel suit of collegiate cut, a flashy blue sweater, belt a tan top coat, and cap to match. He explained. These clothes I got on, they belong to my oldest boy. They're all we've got now. We take turns wearing them. Mr. Hopkins, these people have got to have clothing right away. They've already had their first snow up here. Snow is forecast for tomorrow. It's cold. I'm talking about North Dakota. A letter from North Dakota came, and I read parts of it to FDR, and he said he hoped clothes and blankets could be got out in a few days. Oh, thank God. How do they live through it? You are doing a grand job, my dear. I look at you long as I write. The photograph has an expression I love, so you, and a bit whimsical... <laughs> But then I love every expression. <laughs> December 5th, 1933, Bemidji, Minnesota. My dear one, I've been trying today to bring back your face to remember just how you look. Most clearly, I remember your eyes with a kind of teasing smile in them and the feeling of that soft spot just northeast on the corner of your mouth against my lips. Though I can remember just how you look, I shall want to look long and lovingly at you when we meet again. Dear one, I always want you here in this room with me. 
somehow you visualize more easily here because we've been here so much together. Well, I live in the White House when I'm not on the road. I have a little bed in the uh, dressing room off Eleanor's bedroom, don't you know? <laughs> a world of love to you, devotedly, E.R. In 15 days, I'll be back with Eleanor for Christmas. Your return is getting nearer and nearer, and I'm half afraid to be too happy. I want to wrap my arms around you and kiss you on the corner of your mouth. Every day that passes brings you nearer. I wonder what we'll do when we meet, what we'll say. I don't know just how I shall behave. It's been so long since I've seen you. Never are you out of my heart. Next week, at this very minute, I'll be with you. I'll hold my breath until you arrive. We'll have tea in my room as soon as you get here Friday. I'm going home to the White House for Christmas. Well, that's when I, where I live when I'm not on the road. Oh, Eleanor will fuss over me and read to me and make everything all right. Joy to the world indeed. <laughs> oh, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Christmas was a disaster. Eleanor's daughter announced she was getting a divorce. All hell broke, broke loose. It was a national scandal. I felt like I was some Christmas gift thrown in the corner and forgotten. I left. December 23rd, 1933, the White House. Hick, dearest, I went to sleep tonight saying a little prayer. God, give me depth enough not to hurt Hick again. Darling, I know I'm not up to you in many ways, but I love you dearly, and I do learn sometimes. Dearest one, bless you and forgive me. And believe me, you've brought me more and meant more to me than you know. And I will be thankful Christmas Eve and Christmas Day and every day for your mere being in the world. I'd like to hug you. Good night. Sleep well. A world of love. E.R. A world of love. She didn't stay in love forever. The turning point came two years after that Christmas when I blew up and started yelling at a bunch of tourists who were following us around in Yosemite. This is what she wrote in response to my sterling behavior. Dear one, I'm afraid you and I are always going to have times when we ache for each other, and yet we are not always going to be happy when we are together. Somehow we must find the things which we can do and do them so that what time we have together is as happy as it can be in an imperfect world. Notice she doesn't sign off with a world of love. After Yosemite, she never again wrote those words to me. She felt she couldn't trust me around other people, and, and she was right. She couldn't. That heart full of energy, Eleanor never wanted to fly to me again. She still loved me. We talked on the phone all the time, wrote books together. I lived in the White House all of World War II, so she would have a friend nearby. And of course, she, she wrote me, always. We did find things to do together, just the two of us, for 30 years until she died. 
This is her last letter to me when from her hospital bed. She dictated it to her, uh, her granddaughter, October 10th, 1962. She says that she'll call me as soon as she's strong enough to hold the phone. Yeah. She never did get strong enough to do that. It's six years since my dear one died and I'm still in love. Once you've been had by Eleanor Roosevelt, you stay had. Mm -hmm. And here I sit surrounded by her letters. If I don't give them to the National Archive, what the hell will I do with them? Burn them? Good God. Listen to this one. Dear one, it is all the little things, tones in your voice, the feel of your hair, gestures. These are the things I think about and long for. The feel of your hair. That's a smoking gun. If the uh, director of the FDR library ever read this, and uh, look at this letter. I'm getting so hungry to see you. And this one, when her daughter's divorce was a huge scandal. One cannot hide things in this world, can one? How lucky you are not a man. How lucky you are not a man. In other words, when two women have a love affair, they can hide it from the world. Now, if this isn't a smoking gun, I, I don't know what is in, in, in this. Dear one, so you think they gossip about us. Well, they must at least think we stand separation rather well. I'm always so much more optimistic than you are. I suppose it's because I care so little about what they say gossip about us. They all knew. Everyone around us used to scare the bejesus out of me. But Eleanor just said, oh, hick, what we are doing is just too far beyond the pale to speak about, except behind closed doors. And you were right, madam. You were right about so many things. FDR didn't give a damn, did he? He had his own secrets. How oh, I love that man, what he did for the country, for the world. And am I now going to reveal to that world that I had an affair with his wife? Well, I've already burned quite a few letters, the worst ones. They were the best ones. <laughs> she could be a very naughty girl, you know? <laughs> no, you don't know. I'm the only one who knows that. And I never talked about it, ever. Madam, what am I to do with all the letters you wrote me, huh? Why did you leave this to me? You could have asked for your letters back. You could have told me to burn them all. I would have done it. I would have cried like a baby. But I would have done it. Madam, my beauty, my love, are you ashamed of who I am? You loved me. How can it be shameful 
what we did together, how we felt for each other. My dear one, are you up for being mocked and despised as a pervert? Hmm? Because I am seriously considering giving all the letters to the, what, what's in this one? There's something in it. Rose petals. June 3rd, 1934, Valkyll Cottage. Kick darling. I wonder if any of the sweetness of this little favorite rose of mine will still linger by the time it reaches you. My garden at the cottage was a lovely sight in full bloom, and unconsciously I wanted you to see it with me. Always yours, E.R. I was loved by Eleanor Roosevelt. I was loved by Eleanor Roosevelt. She was my lady. I was her knight, her refuge. We were like two violin strings vibrating in unison to the end. 30 years of love, I'm proud of that. I cannot destroy the letters. They're all that remains. I can not. People will never understand, but I don't give a damn. They will know. I'm giving the letters, all of them, all of them, to the archive, the National Archive. I want people to know. I want you to know. And thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did and want to share it, it'll be online through the month of March. And if you're able, please consider making a donation to Axe Theater to keep us afloat while we wait to come back on stage, live in person for you in the future. You can do that on our website, theexit.org. Or if you're on Facebook, just press that little donate button. Coming up on March 11th, our next Exit Theater Presents will feature physical comedian Tyler West from New York City. I just got information about his show today, so I'm gonna read it off. It says, Foolish, the name of his show, will be most definitely a half hour of uproarious laughter, tear-jerking emotions, brilliant storytelling, hopefully, a montage of several vignettes of combining mime, clown, sound effects, music, singing, dance, and pure genius. And who knows? anything could happen. So please join us on March 11th so we can enjoy Tyler and our talent. And before I go, take care, stay safe, and always remember, in the words of the magnificent, beautiful, talented poet, Diane de Prima, the only war is the war against the imagination. So let your imagination soar. Good night. <laughs>